Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship on this 18th Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, A few announcements for you before we begin. First of all, we are celebrating a baptism today. That was exciting. Uh, Benjamin Charles Youngberg, son of Jack and Nicole, will be baptized right there. Baptized a little bit later in worship. Welcome to you if you're visiting with us for the baptism. Uh, after worship at 1045, Sunday school happens down the hallway for preschool through grade, what, six. Uh, youth and adult forum will be meeting here together. So if you're going to youth forum, don't go to the youth room, come here. Adults also welcome to be here for uh, the youth or the forum that will be about the ELCA youth gathering in New Orleans. Come here from some of our youth and adult chaperones who were at the gathering uh, in New Orleans over the summer. Um, hear about that experience. Or you can go to the fellowship hall for fellowship time. And there is cake provided by the Youngberg family. Thank you for that. Um, So have some cake and celebrate the baptism. Uh, It might seem a little early to think about, but it's not too early to think about trunk or treat coming up. Right? It's fall now, finally, today, right? So uh, trunk or treat is happening on October 26th. It's a change from previous years. It's going to be on a Saturday morning. So it's from 1030 to noon on October 26th. Uh, So consider decorating your trunk and joining us to hand out treats to our neighborhood children. Uh, And then I invite you to check out all the posters all around uh, in the hallway out there in the fellowship hall that highlight all the good work that we as a congregation do to support all the various ministry partners that we have in our community and around the world. So just check out that as we kind of celebrate all the good work that we do as a congregation and as the ELCA. Uh, And speaking of the ELCA, I bring greetings from our newly installed Bishop Jen Nagel. Her installation was yesterday morning at Central Lutheran. Uh, It was a great event. I was there along with about 220 other rostered leaders. We all processed in. It was quite the scene. So there's a video online. You can check it out. It was a great, great installation service uh, for our new Bishop of our Minneapolis area Synod, Jen Nagel. All right, I think that's all I have as far as announcements go. So let us now center ourselves and prepare ourselves to worship by turning to the confession and forgiveness that is printed in our bulletin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives us all our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin and come to God for healing. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have honored you with our lips, but have harmed our neighbors with our tongues. The cravings at war within us cause conflict and disease. In our desire to be first, we make distinctions among ourselves. We place the needs and the suffering last. In your great mercy, forgive us our sins. Draw near to us with grace in time of need, and turn us to follow in the way of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God promises to forgive our iniquity and to remember our sin no more. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of eternal healing, your sins are forgiven. Amen. We sing together our gathering hymn, number 521 in the red hymnal. Please stand as you are able.
We continue in the red folder on page 13. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray together our prayer today. O oh God, our teacher and guide, you draw us to yourself and welcome us as beloved children. Help us to lay aside all envy and selfish ambition, that we may walk in your ways of wisdom and understanding as servants of your Son. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
First reading today is from the book of Jeremiah, 11th chapter. It was the Lord who made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me their deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter, and I did not know it was against me that they devised schemes, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, so that his name will no longer be remembered. But you, O Lord of hosts, who judge righteously, who try the heart and the mind, let me see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Holy wisdom, holy words. Second reading is from the book of James. Who is wise and knowledgeable among you? Show by your good life that your works are done and gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be arrogant and lie about the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceably gentle, willing to yield full mercy and truths without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And the fruit of the righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not know they come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflict. Do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. 
Holy wisdom, holy word. We prepare to hear the gospel by singing the gospel verse. Please stand as you are able. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus and his disciples went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. All right. James, part four. I don't know how we got here. I did not mean for this to happen, honestly. I did not plan on doing a sermon series on James, of all things. Yet here we are. If you haven't been here over the last month, let me bring you up to speed. We are on week four of five weeks in the lectionary in our assigned readings for the Sunday that uh, the second reading comes from the book of James. So we're just kind of, the second reading is going through the book of James chapter by chapter. Now somehow in doing this pastor thing for 23 years now, I have never, I looked back, even touched on James. <laughs> yeah, I know. Seven times through the lectionary, right? That's a lot. I just managed to ignore James. And part of that ignoring comes from the fact that Lutherans aren't really supposed to like James. Uh, Martin Luther hated James. He thought James was too focused on good works and not focused enough on grace. And if you know anything uh, about the Reformation, you know that Luther believed that good works don't save us, but grace does, so it all makes sense, right? As Lutherans, we very much still believe this. But this year, for reasons beyond any understanding that I have, I, I was drawn to James. I just couldn't stay away. And it turns out James is pretty good. Who knew, right? I mean, some people knew, apparently, but I didn't know. I don't think that James, despite what Luther thought, that James discounts grace so much as emphasizes the fact that if grace is real then that grace is going to automatically lead to doing good works. That grace is going to automatically lead to a change in the way we live our lives. And that begins and ends with how we treat our neighbors. When James writes that faith without works is dead, which was a few weeks ago, that may sound a bit harsh, but James isn't wrong. Faith, grace, those things have to lead to something, right? They have to change our lives. But I didn't mean for it to be this way. I thought, oh, I'll focus on James for a week, maybe two. But each week I've read it and I thought, boy, I just can't ignore this anymore. Today it's true because at least in part there's a connection to baptism. You might not see it right away and I'll get there, but I feel like there's a connection especially to our baptismal liturgy 
that we'll be experiencing very shortly. And part of that connection comes from the fact that both this passage in James and the baptismal liturgy reference something that I tend to be kind of uncomfortable talking about. So let's talk about it. Right? And that thing, or a baby person, is the devil. We get reference to the devil in both James and in the baptismal liturgy, actually. And we tend, as Lutherans, not to talk much about the devil. We don't really know what to do with the devil. I don't know what to do with the devil. I mean, I want to stay away from the devil, but <laughs> beyond that, like, how do we understand it? I like to think that, if the, the, that the devil, if he does exist, and actually his existence is even a doubt in my mind, but that the devil doesn't have a lot of power, right? What with Jesus and all? If we have these two forces, Jesus on one side and the devil on the other, which is sometimes how it's portrayed, right? Kind of these two forces at odds with each other. If we have these two forces, these two beings who both make a claim for us, both make a claim for earth and its people and God's people, us, right? Well, clearly Jesus is going to win that battle 100% of the time, it would seem. So how could the devil have any power? Yet the devil gets a little bit of play in the New Testament. Not as much as you might expect. There's not that much focus on the devil in the New Testament. It's, the devil is much more popular in kind of pop culture theology than it is in the Bible itself, actually. But in a few places, such as this passage from James, we hear about the devil. And in James, the devil is very much portrayed as this thing that is in alignment with the powers of the world, especially the powers of the world that defy God, that defy the wisdom of God, to be specific. James writes about the wisdom of the world on one hand and the wisdom of God on the other. And earthly wisdom, or the, the wisdom of the world, is really no wisdom at all, as we hear it in James. Earthly wisdom is that which leads to envy and selfish ambition. Earthly wisdom is that which leads to cravings that are at war within you. Coveting things that you can't have, living with partiality and hypocrisy. That earthly wisdom is the wisdom of the devil, James tells us. He actually uses this word devilish. Kind of a fun little word, right? Devilish. The wisdom of the world is devilish. Now you may wonder, what does baptism have to do with any of that? And that's a fair question. But the connection is there's this one part of the baptismal liturgy, you may remember this, or you'll, you'll experience it shortly if you don't, that... Uh, that I like to call the renunciation. And it's this part of the baptismal liturgy where the, the person being baptized, or the parents, if the person can't do it themselves, parents and the sponsors, make these statements of renunciation. They renounce these certain things. And this part of the baptismal liturgy is actually, was, as it stands now, this kind of expanded renunciation part was, was introduced with our red hymnal, the ELW, in the green, old green LBW hymnal, it was much briefer, it wasn't, there wasn't that much to it, but they expanded it with the ELW, and part of that was to bring back this ancient tradition, because these renunciations have been around since almost the beginning of Christianity. We just kind of lost them along the way for some reason. But we brought them back with the ELW, and I think that's a good thing, this, this ancient tradition that has been a, been a part of baptism since pretty much forever. And the reason I like that we brought it back is that it gives us an opportunity to renounce all the things that work to separate us from God. That's basically what it's all about. All the things, and, and really these are all the things that James has just identified as the wisdom of earth, right? The wisdom of the devil, he says. And the three renunciations are these. This is, this is, these are the questions that are asked. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? Number one. Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? Number two. And do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? Number three. 
And I think one way to think about these renunciations is that they are renouncing all of the competing voices and powers in the world that try to tell us who we are, that try to tell you who you are. Because despite what the world might call you or identify you as, in baptism you are given a new identity. So really it's an identity that's been there from the beginning. And that identity is simply beloved child of God. That's it. Each of us in our baptism, given this new identity. And we are told, you are beloved. And that is very different than the things that the world tells us, right? That the earthly powers, the earthly wisdom tells us. The world likes to label us and categorize us and criticize us and call us names. And those are the things that we renounce in these renunciations in baptism. And maybe that's what all this comes down to, what James comes down to and what baptism comes down to and what Christian theology comes down to. We live in a broken world, yes. We know it. We see it all the time. There's evil all around, whether or not we want to call that of the devil or not and whether we attribute it to the devil or not, there is evil, we know it. Yet, we have a God who through Jesus has given us a new life and a new way by giving us this new identity. This new identity as beloved children of God by showing us a way of love and life in a world that is too often filled with hate and death. Interestingly, that's really what Jesus was getting at in our gospel reading today. As this, as this story goes in the gospel of Mark, Jesus has been trying to get his disciples to understand that he's not going to be the kind of Messiah that they expect him to be. Instead, he's going to suffer and die, he tells them. In this story, Jesus has just tried to explain this yet again. This is the second time now. And what do the disciples do in response to Jesus telling them that he is going to die? They argue amongst themselves about who of them is the greatest. Which is about the most ridiculous thing, right, that you could do at this point. Their rabbi has just told them that he is going to die, and they start arguing about which one of them is the best. It's ridiculous because there is no greatness in death. It won't matter who is the greatest if the one that they thought was going to take the throne is going to die instead. But here's what Jesus is getting at, and it's the same message we hear from James and the same message we hear in baptism. All these forces that tell you to worry about who is the greatest or who you are better than, all these forces that cause you to be jealous or envious of others, all these forces that make you think you can only get ahead if you leave others behind, All these forces that make you think you should lie about others in order to prop yourself up. All these forces that cause you to covet what other people have. All these forces that separate you from God. Jesus has come to destroy those forces. And that destruction happens only after Jesus dies. Because all these forces are forces of death, right? All of these things, these, what James calls, calls earthly wisdom or devilish wisdom, all of them are forces of death. They are things that lead to death, not life. So when Jesus predicts to the disciples that he is going to die, but also that he is going to rise again, what he's trying to show them is that When he rises again, he is going to to defeat all of these forces of death. All of these forces of death will be defeated in his resurrection. With the resurrection, Jesus has already defeated all of those forces of death. Jesus has shown us and the world that these forces of death, and yes, even even the devil, have no power anymore on this earth. 
So when this wisdom of the world, this devilish wisdom, as James calls it, arises from time to time, all we need to know, all we need is the knowledge that the divine wisdom of Jesus always wins and that we, each of us, are beloved children of God. Amen. We continue with the sacrament of holy baptism. You are invited to follow along and participate, beginning on page 227 in the front of the red hymn. God, who is rich in mercy and love, gives us a new birth into a living hope through the sacrament of baptism. By water and the word, God delivers us from sin and death and raises us to new life in Jesus Christ. We are united with all the baptized in the one body of Christ, anointed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and join in God's mission for the life of the world.
Jack and Nicole? No, no, no. You're going to answer a question. <laughs> Called by the Holy Spirit, trusting in the grace and love of God, do you desire to have your child baptized into Christ? If so, please say together, we do. As you bring your child to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with responsibility to live with him among God's faithful people, bring him to the word of God and the Holy Supper, teach him the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, place in his hands the Holy Scriptures, and nurture him in faith and prayer so that your child may learn to trust God, proclaim Christ through word and deed, care for others and the world God made, and work for justice and peace. Do you promise to help your child grow in Christian faith, and life. Erica, do you promise to nurture this person in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Spirit and to help him live in the covenant of baptism and in communion with the church? I do. People of God, do you promise to support Benjamin and pray for him in his new life in Christ? If so, please say together, we do. We do. Now I ask you, this is the part I talked about, I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? And now for all of us, do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand. Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family, and through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you set us free from the power of sin and death and raise us up to live in you. Pour out your Holy Spirit, the power of your living word, that those who are washed in the waters of baptism may be given new life. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Benjamin Charles, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit you give your daughters and sons new birth, cleanse them from sin, and raise them to eternal life. Sustain Benjamin Charles with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence both now and forever. Amen. Benjamin Charles, child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen.
Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let us welcome the newly baptized. <laughs> we welcome you into the body of Christ and into the mission we share. Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to all the world. All right. And as a sign of the love and care of this congregation, we have a baptismal stall. Can you come with me? What do you think? Those fans are always fascinating. All right, join me in welcoming once again the newest member of the body of Christ, Benjamin Charles Youngberg. Yay! There you go. All right, can we go say hi? Say hi to the folks. You know these people, right? Yeah. Hey. What do you think? I don't know. What's happening? Look at all these people. This is the congregation. These are the people you just joined. This is your new family. Extended family, large family. <laughs> yeah, come on. <gasps> <Hey. laughs> I know, look at all these people. What is happening? Hi. <gasps> Hello. Oh, that's over here? Oh, there we go. Hi. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Gotta watch where I'm walking here. Right. Yeah, there are people over here, too. Hello. So these are the people that are going to help your parents keep all those promises they just made. Because they can't do it alone, right? You can't do it alone. So we'll do it all together. All right. All right, we continue with the offering, and children may come forward for children's time. <laughs> All right, did any of you uh, watch any of the Olympic games that happened over the summer, in kind of July and August? Some? Yeah? What was your favorite thing? The girls' Olympic gymnastics? Yeah. Gymnastics, yeah, that was pretty cool. Gymnast gymnastics is pretty cool. Yeah. What? Gymnastics? You like gymnastics too? Swimming. Swimming, nice. You watch any of them? You like swimming? Cool. Yeah, I like agree. Those are those are fun categories. So, if somebody wins, what happens if they win their event? They get a gold medal. Sometimes, if they win, they get a gold medal, right? Who gets the silver medal? Second place. Who gets the bronze medal? Third place. You got it. Yep. If you got fourth place, you don't get anything. That's very sad, right? But it happens. It's very, it's very, it's a, quite an accomplishment to even get to the Olympics, even if you don't get a medal, right? But the, the, those events, right? They they determine who's the greatest, right? Who's the greatest swimmer in the world, right? Because there are people competing from all over the world, all the countries in the world, right, are sending people to compete in the Olympics. So this is a way to determine who's the greatest swimmer, who's the greatest gymnast, who's the greatest basketball team, who's the greatest whatever runner, right? All of these events. 
that take place, right? So I guess that's a, it's, a, it's a nice way to be able to determine who is the greatest. So I was thinking about that because there, in our, did, you, did you pay attention to our gospel story today? No? Okay, all right. Let's be honest. All right, no, did not pay attention. So in the gospel story, we heard that the disciples and Jesus were walking, right? They walked a lot because they wore no cars, right? And I don't think they owned any horses or donkeys or anything. So they walked. Sometimes they took a boat, but usually they walked. And so they were walking along, and Jesus overheard the disciples arguing about something. And I don't know if he heard that he knew what it was, and he was just trying to test them, or if he actually didn't know. But he, he, they get to where they're going, and he, he stops and says, okay, disciples, okay, guys, what were you arguing about? Do you know what they were arguing about? They were arguing about who was the greatest. Who was the greatest, I guess, disciple, right? How, how, would you, how would you judge who is the greatest disciple? What would the disciple Olympics look like? Would it be running fast? Probably not. Who what? Who respects God the most? That's a good answer. How do you measure that then? You ask them some questions. Do a little test. Okay, okay. There used to be a time when when kids would get confirmed, that's something that happens when you're a little older than you are, but they would actually be given a test in front of the congregation. They would have to answer questions. No confirmation students, no holy nativity. You're welcome. <laughs> Some of them are back. The right one's right here. So yeah, they, we don't do that anymore, right? Thank God, right? Can you imagine? Standing up in front of the whole congregation and having the pastor basically quiz you, test you, in front of, like, you have to answer verbally. It's not a written test, right? No multiple choice here. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, anyway, all right. So you can test somebody, right? But, but, so Je but Jesus has an answer for the disciples. This is really, Jesus is like, what are you guys doing? Come on, arguing who's the greatest? That's ridiculous, right? I feel like that's what he's thinking. He doesn't actually say that. But he does say, in order to be the greatest, you have to be the least, the worst. What? I know, right? Isn't that a weird thing? He says, you, if you want to be at the top, you actually have to be at the bottom. And what he talks about, what he says that means, is that you have to be a servant to be the greatest disciple. What does it mean to be a servant? Well, you have to, work for God. to work for God? Well, or to work for people, right? Serve people somehow, right? And I think when Jesus talks about being a servant, he's the example, right? The way that he serves people is he feeds people who are hungry, right? He, he heals people who are sick, Right? Those are ways that he serves people, and maybe those are ways we can serve people too. But he says that if you want to be the greatest disciple, serve people. So maybe it isn't about taking a test, right? Or running a race. It's instead about looking for where people are serving, where people are helping people who need help, right? Look for people who are feeding people who are hungry. Look for people who are providing housing for people who don't have a house. Right? Look for people who are giving clothing to people who don't have clothes. And those, Jesus seems to be saying, are those are the greatest disciples. That's how you would judge who is the greatest, right? Is by who is the best servant. And that's what we should really try to learn from, right? Try to be servants, right? Serve other people. Serve people who need help. Right? All right. Thank you guys for coming up. You guys go back. <laughs> Drawn together in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray with confidence for the church, God's good creation, and all who are in need. Loving God, you welcome all at your table of grace. Instill in your church a spirit of humility and curiosity that we embrace all who seek you. We pray especially for ministries of hospitality and faith formation. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Creating God, you shape the world so there is more than enough for all. Curb our habits of overuse and guide us toward more sustainable sources of energy, food, and water. Lord, in your mercy. 
Hear our prayer. Gracious God, your peace brings justice and solidarity. Encourage peace among peoples, tribes, and nations. Heal divisions in our country and local communities, that together we might cooperate for the good of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, you draw near to, to you all who are in need. Bring healing and wholeness to all who suffer, especially Barb Johnson, Ray Johnson, and those we name before you in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Transforming God, you accompany all through changes and transitions. Help us to see where you are calling this community to new ways of living the gospel promise. Assure us that even as change brings loss, it also brings hope and life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, you embrace us on our final pilgrimage from this life. Accompany all who have died, console those who mourn, and at the last, show us the way to eternal life in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We entrust these and all our prayers to you, holy God, in the name of your beloved child, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the light of God surround us, the love of God enfold us, and the presence of God watch over and protect us. For wherever we are, our God is also there. We close as we began in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing together our mission hymn, number 765 in the Red Hymnal. Please stand as you are able.
Go in peace, follow Jesus.